Okay, so thank you everyone. My name is Sarah Kiden and I'm one of the organizers of this webinar series. I've already thanked my team for putting this together. Um, it's a five part webinar series. So we are starting, this is part one and there are other things coming on universal acceptance, which we invite you to join us for if you can. We will send more information in due time. Um, I'd just like to share some housekeeping rules as you engage. Would like to remind you that we all come from different backgrounds, and nationalities and languages. So please be kind, inclusive and respectful of all people. We would also like to request you to mute your microphone when not speaking to avoid background noise. And we welcome you to enjoy, engage and learn. Um, I would like to thank some people who have made this work, our partners, Mozilla, the Internet Society Uganda chapter, Ministry of ICT and National Guidance in Uganda and the National IT Authority. We are also thankful to ICANN who have helped us to shape this agenda. And without further ado, I would like to hand over to Solana who will invite the panelists and take us through the sessions. If you have any questions, please post on, post on the chat and we'll ensure, we'll try to make sure we answer them. So over to you, Solana. Hello, everybody. I'm so happy to be here. I've been looking forward to this for um, several weeks. And indeed, when Sarah first approached me about the idea of doing a webinar series around universal acceptance, I was really, really glad um, to even have the chance to be involved in uh, shaping the conversation around this. Um, Re restarting, I think, um, conversations that have been going on since the beginning of the internet, but that still are inconclusive. Um, my name is Solana. I, I work for the Mozilla Foundation. I'm the editor of our Internet Health Report, which is an annual publication that looks at whether the internet could be healthier in different ways. Before then, I was the editor of a website called Global Voices, that among many other things, translated um, the internet content in many dozens of languages um, from around the world, looking at online content and trying to make sure that um, there was information about local events um, that was being exchanged and shared uh, between people, speakers of different languages. I'm so looking forward to hearing from the speakers today. Um, who are each experts in different ways on this topic and who can each speak to both the human and the technical um, importance of making sure that the internet is multilingual and works for people who speak different languages. Um, I'm going to ask questions of the speakers, so it won't be um, you know, long presentations, we're going to have a conversation. And I'm also going to ask each of the speakers to introduce themselves before they begin speaking, um, since I think they will probably do the best job of saying who they, who they are and what they're working on. Um, so I will go straight into the topic. Um, I hope you leave this webinar with an understanding of why multilingualism matters and what are some of the human and technical challenges to actually making that a reality. And I'll start with Anasuya. Um, Anasuya, as you, um, after you introduce yourself really briefly, I wonder if I could ask you, isn't the internet global already? Could you tell me some of the ways that it is not? Hi, Solana, and hi, everyone. Um, I'm honored to be here amongst old friends and new. Um, my name is Anasuya Sengupta, and I'm the co-director and co-founder of Whose Knowledge, a global uh, trying to be multilingual campaign to center the knowledges of marginalized communities, or as we like to say, the minoritized majority of the world online. And um, before that, I was the chief grant making officer at the Wikimedia Foundation, which is uh, the nonprofit that operates Wikipedia. Uh, and I'm from India, but right now living in uh, the United Kingdom, uh, heart of my empire, um, mm -hmm. and uh, really very pleased to be with all of you today. Um, so Solana, you asked me a really good question. Isn't the internet global already? 
the answer, as uh, some of our friends might say, is complicated. Um, so it is global in some ways in terms of some forms of reach. So if we were actually to look at the numbers of who has internet access in the world, over 60% of the world is actually digitally connected now. Three fourths of those who are digitally connected are connected from the global south, from Asia, from Africa, from Latin America, from the Pacific Islands and the Caribbean. And nearly half of all women are online, for instance. Yet, what we have is an internet that does not look, sound, and feel like most of us in the world. It is still an internet that in terms of content is primarily monolingual. It is primarily an internet of content in English. When we have content in other languages, they are much more minimally uh, populated, uh, sparse and difficult to access. Um, and even as, and we will obviously talk about this uh, through this conversation, even as there, is, there have been multiple attempts to make the internet feel more global, um, both in terms of technology as well as in terms of cultural and uh, social issues, at the core of the internet, like all global infrastructure, is power and privilege. And whose power and whose privilege over both technological infrastructures as well as social cultural infrastructures is a political issue. And therefore the internet is not anywhere as global as we would like it to be. I'll stop there and I can say more as, as we continue to have the conversation. Well, thank you so much. And I, I guess I would then switch over to Joe who is uh, an expert uh, in many ways on the architecture of the internet. And I wonder, Joe, if you could introduce yourself briefly, and if you could also say, well, what are some of the key technical difficulties that you have encountered in making the internet work for people who speak and write different languages? Um, was the internet not always intended to be global? Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm excited to be here. Um, so uh, I currently run a very small uh, consulting shop that does uh, fractional CTO work. So if your company needs a little bit of a CTO for a small amount of time, that's what we do. Before that, I was VP of engineering for Firefox uh, at Mozilla. And most of the engineers who uh, work on Firefox report to me at the time. Uh, before that, I was at Cisco, worked on WebEx, uh, and before that, um, I worked on a standards-based instant messaging system called Jabber, or XMPP, um, and so I've done a lot of standards work at the IETF and a few other places um, where these issues of how to bring the different peoples of the world together, the, the, the political will to do that meets the actual bits and bytes that go on the wire and the formatting of those and the comparison of those uh, become reality. Um, that in that work, there are, th there are three main things that I've seen um, that were particularly difficult. The entire spectrum um, is, is overly complicated because people are involved at every point um, and people's cultures are involved and people's self-identities are involved. And that complexity makes the technical problem uh, challenging in a way that people who first come to the problem expect, oh, this, this is a solved problem, this will be easy. And then they run into the fact that all of the peoples of the world disagree on everything, which is one of the things that is beautiful about being human is that there are all these different viewpoints. So the three, three main things that I've run into are um, dealing with freeform text. So this is the text that's running in your web browser as you're reading uh, an article, for example. And that feels like it is a relatively solved problem compared to some of the others. 
However, it is relatively solved because of the, the heroic work of a very small number of people, um, each of whom understands their piece of the problem, may not understand the other pieces of the problem, and has no uh, succession plan for what happens when they retire um, and what will happen to the software that they understand that nobody else does. So for example, um, how do you enter characters for a particular language? There are a, there may be three people in the world that understand how to do that for enough of the different languages um, that exist. So that's, that's one piece, it's just this free flowing text. The next is the text that goes into a program like Zoom, for instance, the menus, the, uh, the help text, the, each one of the buttons, et cetera. Um, that is a surprisingly difficult problem um, for a variety of reasons. Uh, and it is now sort of on the way towards being solved, but is still like every programmer does that slightly differently. Every program does that slightly differently. And there are no real standards in that space yet. And the last the place where I've spent most of my time is how do I take two identifiers? So for example, an email address and compare them to see if they're equal. And that turns out to be a shockingly difficult problem. Uh, and when we first go, when we first learn, learn coding, it's this is a very simple one step operation. How hard could this possibly be? Yes, if all of the all of the text you're comparing is English and a subset of English, a very small subset of English, then yes, it's an easy problem. Uh, however, if people like to use their names as a part of their identifiers, which happens frequently, now we've brought in all the human complexity that is important to people's self-identity. So I'll stop there. Thanks so much. Oh, I'm dying to, to talk to talk more to all of you about these topics and get, get started. Um, Bonface, uh, I would like to turn to you next. Um, if you could please introduce yourself and uh, you could tell us something about why you have been involved in translating content, particularly about internet governance um, from English into African languages. Why does this matter? Tell us more. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Solana. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Bonfes Fitaba. I'm a language activist, local content developer, a writer, and researcher. Um, over the last decade, I've been involved in a number of uh, language initiatives. So, um, so we first of all, with Facebook, and then with the tech company, Hong Kong-based uh, tech company, and then Icon Wiki, and then Global Voices, um, and Localization Lab. So um, if, if you look at the statistics, there are over 7,000 languages uh, uh, across the world. So 28% um, of these languages are spoken in Africa. So Swahili alone has about 150 million speakers. And, and if you look at the content online, uh, it's, it, Swahili is invisible because the, the content according to Google statistics, the content is about 0.08%. Uh, so this means that English continues to be the lingua franca of the internet. So uh, as a result, it hampers the way uh, the indigenous people would have gotten online. So which is uh, part of, uh, I mean, just deterring people getting online because it says about 17 million people have no reason at all to get online because the internet is not in their language. So uh, there's a strong need for a multilingual in internet so that to ensure that the aspect of inclusion uh, is considered. Absolutely, thank you so much. And I think you see now how we're moving to different parts of the internet, um, the things that you read, the way that it's constructed. Um, and there's a new frontier now, I think also that we need to incorporate into this line of thinking. Um, Rebecca, I'd like to turn to you because you're working on voice technology um, and looking at how to expand in multilingual directions there. Could you tell us about the work that you are doing with Common Voice and what drew you to this work, why you find it interesting? Thank you. Um, 
Thank you, Solana. Um, I'm Rebecca um, from Tanzania, and I'm a Kisahili Community Engagement Fellow at Mozilla. Sorry for my voice, I have a cough. Um, so I'll just explain a little bit about my engagement in the project. I've been interested in languages for a while. Uh, I think one of the people that introduced me to languages and content is here, Boniface. Uh, I learned about languages, diversity from him. Um, so the importance of having diverse languages in the internet is something that's undeniable, especially in the world that we live in. Uh, if we're trying to build a community that can access the internet from whatever part of the world we're from, we need to ensure that there's the language that can enable any person to feel comfortable on the globe to be on the internet. So I think that's the part that drew me close to this project. Um, the Kisahili Common Voice Project is, uh, is a project that's funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and GIZ at Mozilla. And, it's and if, a I could project. if I could interrupt, maybe you can explain what Common Voice is to the folks sure, who don't sure. know. Okay, Common Voice is a platform by Mozilla where one can donate voice. Uh, people can also validate voice data sets, the set of sentences that are available as a sentence corpus. You can do the sentences and donate your voice to be able to be part of the people that contribute to a voice data set that people can use openly anywhere. It's an open source. Anyone can contribute, anyone can make use of the data to develop the technology or build something out of it. Uh, we feel that's what the Common Voice platform is about. Thank you, Rebecca. And Remy, you're also on the call. Um, could you, you've also been involved in Common Voice, but adjacent to that, you're also working on technologies that help people make use of open source technologies uh, as, as the voices that will come out of the Common Voice project. I would love if you could introduce yourself as well um, and just say briefly what you have worked on and what you consider um, important and necessary in this field. Thank you so much, Solana. Yeah, and uh, my name is Remy Murire and I'm currently based in Kigali and I'm a community fellow at Mozilla and working on both on Kenya Rwanda and Uganda language. Uh, so basically, my work, it's more of uh, identifying actually use case and, and, and dropped strategy around voice collection and text corpus creation on, on the Common Voice platform. Yeah, and so uh, I've joined actually a year ago and, 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 and like a lot of been actually happening and around, around voice. And, and, and from the question you were asking me, it's more like, once an African voice, uh, once African voice technology exists, so what's what's the needs actually for it? I think there is quite a lot happening on the continent, and uh, like in terms of actually fintechs, government services, and a lot. And and recently, so uh, we got this uh, an AI voice in the TV, and so I was actually showing my mom how she can easily switch uh, between YouTube and HDMI. And like she was actually amazed, but the technology were more actually powered in English. And she doesn't speak English. She speaks actually French and the native language, uh, Kenya Rwanda, my friend. And I was like, and I was trying to explain to her that actually this is the work I'm doing actually at Mozilla because before she couldn't actually understand what I was actually doing. Yeah, and, <laughs> and it was quite good. But I think there's, there's quite a lot. And before actually joining Mozilla three years ago, I was working on this, at, 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 at the startup. Uh, called Save, and so that startup were actually helping people saving money collectively, and so it's actually underserved people, people in rural areas. So it's more of people who actually put money together because they don't have actually access to financial, um, like like they can't actually borrow um, loans from any banks. So they'll be actually borrowing money from that group. And one day I went on the site, and there was actually this old old grandma. And she wants, she couldn't actually contribute, but she has actually a future phone and she will always give her mobile money. I think you have heard of MPSA before uh, to the group admin and her password. Those are actually security linkage to contribute for herself. And, and I was like, this, this system can actually be powered with voice because she can communicate, she can call. And so basically, so there's a lot actually. And, um, I'm actually very happy that I'm actually working on, on, on these projects. 
And there's also a lot going on like in Rwanda because nowadays this platform, uh, it's a government platform running by a startup called the Rainbow. And every citizen of Rwanda can actually request a birth certificate, a marriage certificate on the platform. But there's actually like a huge gap into uh, like within the digital literacy among actually people around. So basically they have actually to recur to agents, service agent, and then pay a fee to recur for the service because the platform is mainly poured like on the web and a USSD uh, platform. So having that, like maybe we voice in there, but people will be actually for easy actually for them to call and then get access to those services. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll stop by here, yeah. And it's interesting also to hear how, even as we're struggling with some of these very basic um, systems, input systems, how do you type on the internet? Or how do you make text appear on the internet? We're also getting even more ambitious about what we want to be doing in different languages um, and spoken and heard. And um, it, it's one of these things that I feel comes up with the internet a lot, that things are moving in, in two directions, in both a healthy and an unhealthy direction at the same time. And Asuya, when you were talking, you, were, you mentioned how central power is to this um, dynamic. And I wonder if we're thinking about um, decolonizing the internet, as some people call it, or if we are going to be resisting um, typographic imperialism, as other people call it, what are some of the things that need to happen? Thanks for that question, Solana. And, you know, it, it's wonderful to be on a panel of people who are thinking and doing um, multilinguality uh, online, on the internet in so many different ways. Um, I'm even more excited about the conversation now. Um, I think one of the key things to start with saying is, why is it so important that we are multilingual um, on the internet? Because we are, as you know, Boniface pointed out, so multilingual in life. There are over 7,000 languages and those are just spoken languages. If you think about languages that are visual, that are sign, that are drum languages, we have such extraordinary depth and breadth of language in the world. And language is not simply language. Um, what it is, is a way of seeing the world. It's not only identity, it is identity, of course. So much of our identities are tied up in language, but it is literally ways of seeing and knowing and doing that are different based on the languages that you see and know and do in. So for instance, someone who is speaking Kiswahili is thinking and imagining differently than when they might be speaking or thinking in French or in English. Um, I come from South Asia and I speak a few South Asian languages. I know that when I speak in English, my worldview is different. So if the internet is to be a global infrastructure, I think it's really important that we recognize that multilinguality is, as, as we're all saying, not just a technical issue, not just a social issue, it's a socio-technical issue that is at the core of how we understand ourselves in the world. So having said that, I think some of the ways that are really key to thinking about how to bring uh, knowledges online, which is what you know, language is, a, 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 a container for knowledge. Um, I think, as you said, you know, on the one hand, um, access is an issue, access of very simple infrastructure in terms of electricity and so on, then of course device, then input systems. But at the same time, if we don't have at the core of these different um, systems of access, the people for whom the language is critical, the people for whom the language is a way of knowing and being, then the ways that those systems are designed, the way the keyboard is designed, the way the input system is designed, the way content is understood, um, it, it becomes extremely, um, it becomes limited. So one of the key aspects of decolonizing the internet, as we like to say, um, 
is that we recognize that this is about centering the leadership, the design and the imaginations of those of us who are the majority of the world. So how do we start thinking about exactly what Joe pointed out, right? If there are just three people in the world who literally know how in multiple languages to understand input methodologies the best, why is it only three people? And most likely those three people are going to be from the global north. Why is that? How do we ensure that this is being, that even the infrastructure, even those of us who are at the heart of the infrastructures of language are much more from our own communities, are leading this work from our communities, obviously with our allies and support from those who already have power and privilege in these worlds. So that's, I think, at the core of the issue. And as you can see, and as, as, as my friends on this panel have already said, part of the ways of doing this is for this um, meeting of multiple expertises. When those of us who have different kinds of expertises in language come together to create community driven projects. Um, and you know, we, we, we support some of those, as you know, um, but, at, but there's, a baseline of awareness that needs to be created uh, amongst all of us to recognize why this is important and to move the conversation from just being about technology. Because sometimes when we, the technical is not uh, a trivial problem, as we know, and, and as we've discussed, but it is, it's, it's actually only one layer of the problem. Um, and so I think, making sure that we are in conversation with each other, making sure that we are constructing community-led projects uh, that are led by those who are experts in their own communities with support from others is one of the key aspects of making this happen. Um, and of course, as we go on in the conversation, I can bring more examples of this, but I would love to hear what others think. I would love to hear what Joe thinks. <laughs> I'm sure you, ha you have something you would love to say after that. I mean, yeah, it's, there has been a history of people who look like me sitting in rooms with other people who look like me, making decisions, we hope, with the best wisdom available to them at the time, but without adequate representation, without adequate voices being heard of experiences that are unlike the ones that we grew up with, that wisdom can only be limited. There, there's a limit to how far it can go. And as technologists, we often gloss over those issues of representation and voice uh, and say, ah, oh, well, we get it close enough. Uh, we can't find anybody to help us. We went and asked and nobody wanted to help. And uh, well, we're here, there's nobody else. Um, so we'll do the best we can. And sometimes doing the best you can is what's, what's available, but it's rarely enough. And so some of the things that, that sort of hold that back are the, the drumbeat of large corporations that need to ship software today and need to, um, need to drive revenue and those sorts of things. And, and often those are the people that are, uh, people representing those interests are the ones who are funded to travel to go to these conferences and to participate. Uh, and so it self-reinforces. And I do like the phrasing of decolonization because it's, it's, um, it's intentionally uh, aggressive uh, and allows people to, to decide whether they're going to react defensively or whether they're going to embrace the potential for this larger conversation. And I think there are a lot of people of goodwill who have been involved in the process that given the opportunity to be a part of a larger conversation would opt to do so. 
So I think that there is a lot of good potential for a larger conversation. Boniface, I'd, I'd love to ask you about the potential because you're somebody who's been involved in, in rallying people to this cause for many years in different languages. What do you think is the appetite for multilingualism on the internet when people have no experience of what multilingualism on the internet is already. So if you log on to the internet, like you say, and you don't see anything in your content, what any content in your language, what would make you want to see it enough to actually do something about it? How do you, how's your experience been of that? Thank you, Solana. Uh, all right. Um, like I mentioned, 17 million people, again, uh, have no interest at all to get online because of the internet not being in a language that they understand. So Swahili, especially, uh, the, the content when you get online, there's not much work, despite the fact that we, over the last decade, we've been trying to work on initiatives here and there, but there's a lack of enough data sets uh, to even help in uh, uh, natural language uh, processing uh, and machine learning, you know, I uh, understand Mozilla is working on, on, on the voice uh, uh, data project. So, but yes, uh, when you get online and you, you have, like my grandmother, they get online and there's no content that's there in, in, in their language. And then it's just, uh, it's, it's, it's like, it's not a motivation enough for anyone to get online. For instance, because content is just not uh, about, localization is not just about the language itself, because you need to get online. If, even if, let's say you're on Facebook, you get online, it's in Swahili, but is there a content that you could uh, resonate with? Is there a content that is in Swahili? So uh, it goes hand in hand, either both with the language as well as the content, because you have to get the content that is honest with the community. Uh, that's using the, the internet. And Remy, is it enough just to build the technology? There's a, there's a saying in English that keeps coming back to me now. It's, it's a, maybe it's only from a movie, but they say, if you build it, they will come. If you build the technology, will, will people come? Will amazing things just be created? Um, what would you what would you say to that? Yeah, I think it's true because like if you build a technology, people will come, right? I think like there's actually a lot of households like in Africa who have maybe a smart TV, right? Or maybe don't really know the usage of the smart TV, right? And because like most of those TV are not actually like local lights for them, right? Mainly, like I was actually saying, the, the AI future, the voice future, it's mainly actually in English. So how about actually having them in, 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 in native languages? That's just a TV. And yeah, I think like if you, if you, if you like build actually a really like voice technology system, because there's Africa mainly, the main uh, part, like economically Africa is actually part of actually agriculture, right? There's a lot of people doing agriculture in Africa those farmers, they really need content. They really need to know how they can actually grow crops. But like sometimes they don't really have like, like access to information to those kind of content. And I think actually voice is something which can actually power that like moving, moving forward, yeah. And Rebecca, if I could ask you a sort of a personal question, a personal angle, when you imagine the work that you're doing and the things that you are trying to accomplish, do you have a vision for what that internet would be like you know if if everything works out how how um you wish for what would it what would the internet then be like for you um and how realistic do you think it is to get there so i think for me i envision where the internet is accessible by everyone by accessible i mean there's content that is relevant to every person according to their needs in terms of language, in terms of the specific things that I want to find online, they should be able to access it. But also as far as infrastructure and access and everything is involved, that's, that's the 
kind of internet that I feel is good, but I also think an internet that is inclusive in terms of gender, it's accessible by both male and female, everyone can access it, that's the ideal kind of internet. But um, for me, I find that the challenge first, for example, for Africa is we are great consumers of foreign technology, we do not develop our own. So I think we need to promote uh, people to have or to curate local homegrown solutions. That's why we need things like voice data that are available in local languages for people to be able to make use of that, to create solutions that actually work for their people, that are actually built by their people. So that challenge is we need to first raise the awareness, people to know that we need to create our own solutions. We do not need to just be consumers, but we also need to make sure that we are actually working with the people to create these solutions so that the solutions are for the people. They're not just picked from somewhere and then put to people. For example, I say I live in a French speaking country, but I don't speak French. Most of the time I don't watch TV because it's in French. There's nothing for me. Maybe if I'm watching animals, at least I, I know animals. But I can imagine it's the same case for someone watching the internet or going through the internet browsing and finding that they don't have anything that's for them. Then they don't see a need for it. It will just be a decoration that we have on the wall that doesn't make any sense to the people themselves. Thank you. Thank you. Joe. When, when you mentioned the, the three people with, with the knowledge of how a specific system works, it reminds me of a, a conversation that we had a long time ago, which was it, it made the internet seem similarly fragile, where you, you mentioned something about a spreadsheet, an old spreadsheet that somebody was maintaining and how it was connected to the DNS system of the entire internet. And sometimes it's stories like these that make me feel like it's extremely um fragile in some way and and makes makes me worry about wanting to tamper with something that is so delicately balanced and at the same time gives me optimism that it wouldn't be so difficult to change as it sometimes feels because the internet is so huge and it feels like the problems are so insurmountable but then when i hear from somebody like you who has been very close to how the technology is created it seems like you could just change that spreadsheet or invite a few more people to come join. Is that is that how it is? Yeah, uh, it's surprising. Um, most people expect that the barrier to entry to be a part of the internet standards community is high, that it would require some sort of credentialing or that somebody would have to invite you or that sort of thing. In fact, all of the work of the Internet Engineering Task Force, which is where a bunch of the standards are made, is done on mailing lists that are open for anyone to join. And they're archived, so you can go back and look at the previous discussions, and all of the documents are published freely. Um, and so the barrier to entry is, do you have enough English to be a part of the conversation, which is still a big barrier, but it is not a, uh, it's not a process barrier. Um, and so I'll, as we talk, I'll send a few links to, to some, some places to get involved where people, if they want to go and change the way that things are done, be a part of that conversation. It is still a club. There are still in groups and out groups and clicks. Um, but I think you find that in any human enterprise uh, and this is, is not terribly different from that. Um, but you can get involved and can get your voice heard relatively easier than you might expect. Uh, it may be that what we were talking about before the spreadsheet that you mentioned might have been the list of time zones, uh, which we eventually did standardize and put under the control of, of some folks that are, are thinking about it and know how to talk to ISO and blah, blah, blah. There, there is, before that, however, there was one professor who tracked every single time zone change that was known in history in one spreadsheet. And that, that file still ships with most operating systems, uh, but now it's under the control of, uh, of the Internet Assigned Names Authority. So it's, it's at least has a process behind it um, for making changes. So 
that was exactly the spreadsheet I had in yeah. mind. <laughs> Uh, a, a friend of mine at Cisco was the one who wrote the document to describe how that the, the file should be formatted and who should get to change it and what are the processes for making the change and how to describe the changes uh, when one side of town is on, on one time zone and another side of the same city is in a different time zone and how do you handle that? Again, another complicated issue. Anasuya, thank you, Joe. Um, Anasuya, more on, on the, the fragility of our internet communities. You, you've done so much work to, um, I suppose, support people in making something like Wikipedia multilingual, um, which is a similar, similar to some of what Joe was saying in, in the way of, it's easy to get involved if you know how to get involved. Um, but what are some of the ways um, that you think, what are some of the ways that you see promise, you know, where, where, where people are beginning to make um, language uh, progress in, di in different realms? Um, yes, I, I, I'm wearing my Wikipedia t-shirt for those who can see. <laughs> Um, I do edit Wikipedia and I have been a Wikipedian and a Wikimedian for a long while. Um, and Wikipedia is a really good example of both what can go right with multilinguality and what is yet to come and needs to come. Um, I, I like to joke that if, uh, you know, if the uh, aliens were to land tomorrow and they were to look at Wikipedia and its language versions as a way to understand the world, they'd think that Esperanto was the 36th most spoken language in the world, which is, you know, that's telling. Um, most of the top 20 languages are not the top 20 uh, Wikipedias. And similarly, as, as we've said, you know, um, one of the ways that people access the internet is to access it in their nearest colonial language, as Rebecca pointed out so, so uh, beautifully just now. Uh, and yet there's hope. And there's not just hope, I think there's excitement. And the reason is this again, I'm going to come back to all of us who are interested in language using the frame of knowledge, because I think one of the ways to build both awareness and action around this is to recognize that we're not just making the internet multilingual. When we make it multilingual, we're making it multi-knowledge, right? And so to say to our peoples that if we have to have our knowledges more widely shared in the world, this is one way to bring it on. And we need to be driving that and doing it in multiple ways because the closest version to embodied knowledge we have that is not meeting in person, and COVID has demonstrated that really, really uh, powerfully, is in some ways the, the multimedia, multi-form internet. The digital space gives us some real possibility around multimodalities of expression, right? And that to me is one of the most exciting ways to think about how we uh, create community and lead community around language. So as an example, um, one of the uh, pro you know, processes I've been really interested in and excited about is how indigenous uh, communities bring their languages online when their languages are primarily visual visual and oral languages. So of the 7,000 languages, almost half of all languages are oral languages. They don't have writing systems or are not predominantly led by writing systems. Um, and so if you look at a, at, at a um, project called the Indig Emoji, for instance, that is a group of Australians um, or indigenous communities from Australia, uh, pulling together emojis in Aranda, which is their language, what they did was this incredible transgenerational process in which they sat down with the aunts and the grandmothers and the grandfathers and the uncles and, you know, younger folks, as well as scholars, as well as um, folks who were multilingual in English and in Aranda, 
and started trying to understand what would be the emojis that would actually um, animate Arinda online. And so now, if you are an Arinda speaking uh, person or you're interested in learning about Arinda, you can actually go to the Indig Emoji app and download it and use the emojis to express yourself in Arinda. Similarly, um, there's uh, a group of folks uh, who are looking at the Mapuche language uh, that is uh, an indigenous territory across Chile and Argentina. And um, the group called Kimultewe um, has looked at multiple ways in which to use graphics uh, and memes and different kinds of audiovisual um, methodologies, including the first uh, dictionary in Mapuche um, to support a community that comes online and starts using Mapuche online and creates content online. The thing though that is really important is again, to the point of if we build technology, people will come, that too is complicated. Um, people need to feel like they can be that they can find themselves not just represented, but centered in ways that uh, the internet yet doesn't yet offer, which is why these really interesting projects in which we're bringing together technologists, linguists, community scholars, um, community organizers to bring different forms of language online to me are just incredibly exciting uh, and hopeful spaces to be. Um, even on Wikipedia, which has uh, content in nearly 500 languages, it's really only 100 languages or 200 languages in which the content is relatively stable. And even there, it's so text-based that many of those languages are not adequately represented in the fullness of their knowledge and the fullness of the way they understand the world. So Wikipedia also, for instance, is and the Wikimedia movement is trying to understand right now, what does it mean in which we see language not as a two-dimensional uh, character on a screen, but really as this multi-dimensional living, breathing thing that is at the center of how we understand the world. But there is, to me, this is the, this is the hope of the internet. This is the internet I want to see, right? Uh, as the Zapatistas say, I want to see a world in which multiple worlds can live. I want to see an internet in which multiple internets can be. Me too. <laughs> Me too. Um, I want to encourage anybody who has a question, feel free to post it in the chat before we, we end the session. We still have 10 minutes left. Boniface, um, when do we know that we have accomplished this? By what measure do we know that a language is adequately served online. I think a lot of times when, when people use measures of how many languages are represented online, they'll look at the top American websites or the top English language websites, and then there's a, a calculation or some statistic, but you know, I, I've, sometimes I feel like it's comparing apples and oranges. It doesn't really make sense for um, speaking about not just multilingualism, but multi-knowledge, as Anasuya was talking about. Um, how do we know that we have accomplished multi-knowledge? Um, maybe, you know, what would be the measure for the languages that you speak? Well, thank you. Thank you, Solana. Um, I think based on the process that we've been doing here, um, that, that feeling where someone gets online, uh, whether it's an international website, because I, I see uh, some websites like the United Nations uh, UN Habitat or uh, um, Environmental Organization. When you go to their website, there's option of all the, those languages, like someone is able to check on their, uh, their website, either in English or Spanish or the UN languages. And then now there's an addition for Swahili. So that, that gives uh, at least an indicator that there's someone somewhere who's giving cons consideration to the local community because UNEP is based here in Nairobi. 
so uh, if you look at East Africa, the speakers, the Swahili. So I think that feeling where someone gets online and they're able to get the content in the language that they best understand, I think for me, uh, that would be one of the indicators because yes, it's, it's, it's hard to measure if you compare with all other international websites and all that, but we should be content with this, the small wins, like getting online, getting biz, um, and various other projects also trying to have local content, either in the indigenous languages or the Swahili language as, as a whole. And Remy, if I could ask you, what are some of the um, technologies you think that are missing for us to accomplish multi multi-language, multi-knowledge, um, specifically thinking about what Anasuya was saying, that it's not just about text, it's also about video, it's also about emojis and images and different ways of communicating and engaging with one another. What are some of the technologies that first come to mind um, for you that people need access to, um, at not just at the consumer level, but also as developers, well-meaning developers who are trying to make a difference? Yeah, I'll first actually like tap on the consumer level. And I think um, like speaking, like most of the technology people are using currently in Africa are more of like USSDs. So it's actually unstructured codes like to check balances. And like people also refer to use interactive voice uh, uh, system, like calling actually a pre-program like tests and then we act which actually answer. And then most of those technology actually in English so like actually having those technology like in, uh, like interactive voice recognition like maybe for farmers like in native language that would be actually something very good and, and having bots on the uh like in the back here yeah. i think actually uh developers actually should regard to like more building bots in in native languages and then before having that we need to actually create actually a huge first data set actually to train all those uh, uh, models, all those machine learning models actually to like NLP models to understand actually like um, any actually inquiry in any, any, any languages, yeah. Thanks. Thank you all. And Rebecca, I'll let you have the final word. <laughs> Was there anything in this conversation that surprised you or left you with fresh inspiration for the work ahead? Um, I think I was reading the chats and I was really following about uh, the gendering of languages. I found that quite interesting. Uh, but apart from that, I also think there's a lot of work that needs to be worked on in that space. I think a lot of people have been doing research around how Siri and Alexa respond to sexual harassment and they found that there's still a lot lacking around there. So the development area needs a lot of work. But also I think we also need to really look at how we can engage all groups. Um, having voice technology that can help maybe the blind can help to bridge these gaps, but we also should look at, I think someone raised something on the chat about sign language as a language, which is quite interesting as well. Um, so I think there's a whole diverse set of things that we need to look at if we're going to deal with the multilingual internet. One of them is looking at some of the points that have been raised by participants and speakers overall. So I find that it's beyond just the languages we know, but also things such as sign language that I mentioned before. I think there's a lot of work it needs a diverse group of stakeholders, but more importantly, the community that we are trying to bring online by having the language there needs to be the people that are actually involved in a part of the process, otherwise it won't be theirs. I think that's what I can say. Thank you. Thank you. And I hear that there is one question. Sarah? Uh, yes, there's a hand up from Josephine Melissa. So Josephine, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, so not really a question, it's just to um, add a bit of reflection on what um, has been said and uh, the work that I do. So I work in uh, community networks, which is um, 
it supports communities uh, in different parts of Africa to build their own internet or sort of intranet or just build their own digital in infrastructure. So the work, actually the conversation resonates a lot uh, with what we do um, in that in terms of even like working with communities to, to sort of like working towards closing the digital divide, which is enabling communities to build and operate their own infrastructure. We find that um, 80 percent it's actually the local or the community or the social engineering as we call it and only 20 percent is the technology so we appreciate like their efforts to you know their efforts like they're around technology based uh, solutions that can be able to support uh, universal acceptance uh, but i also think that there is really not enough initiatives or groups that are supporting this work at the local or at the grassroots level. Uh, so, um, for example, when we're talking about um, the creation of, of local content or more people or this localized content being online, um, there's need to not just map out the existing technologies, but also map out at the community level who are actually the knowledge producers at that level and um, also what sort of information does the community uh, want to share um, online or what can be just sort of archived in their own intranet that is sort of private um, to them. So lots of learning from this and I look forward to, um, the, to more to learning more on this. Thanks so much for that reflection, Josephine. Um, thanks so much to all the speakers. I think we've heard so many examples of things that we can all do to get more involved on these topics. I encourage you to visit the initiatives um, that people spoke about in this call. This is a webinar series. There are more conversations on this topic that dive into even more of the technical aspects of what is happening. There are many things in the internet governance space that I'm sure Access Plus um, and our hosts today would be very eager <laughs> to talk to you about and get you involved in. I found this conversation deeply inspiring. I find the work that you all do very inspiring. Um, thank you so much. And um, I'll pass it back to Sarah. Um, thank you so much, Solana, and thank you, panelists. It's been a very nice conversation. I see a lot of things happening on the chat. I even wished we had planned for 90 minutes instead of 60. But we'd like to thank you so much, for our panelists, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. This call uh, has been recorded, so we'll share it with you. And please join us on the fourth Thursday of next month for the next part of this webinar series. Thank you, everyone, and have a good morning, afternoon, and evening.